I just stand somewhere close to the nickel. So, I'll talk about stocks in my scope first, and I'll do a bit more current topics at the end. So, I never finished university, of course, I lots of found it. Uh, started a company before I went to university, a computer consultancy, because I couldn't find anyone who wanted to hide me when I programmed in strange language like C. But in the 80s, it was. Uh, wasn't that hot. I did study computer science for a while, but I actually learned to program, it wasn't that good. I was way back in the futures. And the academic theoretical stuff was boring, so. Uh, and the other my co founders, the main guy is Montevideenius, who is the main coder. Because we used to work together from the early 80s, we never figured out what year, but long time. Uh, and I started following things like free software as business in the 80s. I heard Richard Stallman, the founder of new projects in 1986. So free open source software was for a very, very long time. And we actually planned to do some stuff. We couldn't figure out what until 1995 when we needed our own database for the web. Uh, we couldn't find one to work. We did try. We tried hard to find something. My school wouldn't exist. Uh, since we didn't find something, we started coding and we thought, well, I thought we could release it open source under this license, we could make some money. You know, enough to take part of Sarah. And in 95, we started coding. 96, we had the first release. 97, it kind of got real, it was usable. And uh, we got like 1,000 downloads in a very short time. Because there were other people who had the same need as we had. In uh, 97, we got the first tiny revenue. We basically had a site out there that said, if you want support, you can pay money in here. Uh, not very advanced, but no marketing, sales, anything. But a few people actually just paid without us even doing anything. That was nice. Um, and 99, we started talking at conferences. And I was lucky, because I found out that I was nervous before, but not during. My friend was super calm before, but nervous during the talk, and my version was simpler. Um, and after the first time the tutorial, you're not even nervous before. Uh, and 99, we started talking to possible investors, which, I mean, now investing companies and different boards and etc. have a good clue about it, but at that time, I was pure developers, so when people say, so have you talked to any VCs, I go like, and water closets, that's toilets and sweeters. <laughs> <laughs> and then we made venture capital. But we didn't quite know what it meant or anything. Uh, and when we started, I mean, we didn't start a company. Uh, we had our own companies, both me and all the other founders, those three guys. Had our personal company, some companies together, because it's very easy to start companies in Finland, Sweden. We have these tiny companies where Paperwork once a year when you did the taxes, and otherwise they just existed. Uh, no administration, no nothing. So when we started the MySQL, we just released source code and we kind of wrote something in a header. But we did no paperwork, we had no control over it. <coughs> but the difference from other projects is we had a commercial agenda from day one. We planned to make money the first time we released code. It wasn't a big company, we planned to make money to pay part of our salary. We had no investment or anything, uh, but it worked since we had we were self-employed, so we could switch quite a bit practice. We could switch flip from sweet sleeping time to working on my scroll. And when it actually started to get income, we could increase it, uh, the time we spent and do less hours. We did no company from the beginning and we did no paper or what around it. It was an administrative help. And uh, we were Multinational from day one, we can say, because I was based in Sweden and I was based in Finland. Uh, the seeds of success. Why do I think MySQL became successful? Well, the basic thing is was to solve the common problem. A lot of people had to solve. So people were looking for a solution. You didn't have to sell, you know, oh, you do this much better with this. Uh, we developed a practical production use. 
So we used a different action. When it didn't work, people called us in the middle of the night. That was bad. Uh, so we tried to get it really stable. Theoretical stuff about how databases should behave was completely irrelevant if you had a bug in it. Uh, so it was more aimed at bug free than at uh, <coughs> uh, We had pretty high speed needs, so we were able to focus on speed over features. Uh, and mostly my problem was the I installed a few hundred, literally, open source free software programs since the mid 80s. Well, we have Could you use this one first? Sure. Or I can back up. Does this work better? Yes. yes. Uh, Good. <laughs> uh, well, uh, yeah. We, I spent a lot of time downloading and installing hundreds of open source free software packages, so I had a pretty good feeling of the pain. If one would you know, distribute a packet with one comma wrong, now you don't use make files anymore, but at that time you actually compile it. You know, one comma wrong, and everyone who downloads has to spend an hour fixing it. So we really tried to get every comma right to make it really easy to compile and install. And the goal to be able to install it in 15 minutes. And this is downloading and compiling from source. Nowadays with package system, installing in 15 minutes is like, what? <laughs> uh, at that time, it was quite aggressive. So we spent a lot of time on extremely <coughs> boring tasks of installation, portability, and documentation. And the reason for that was we had this commercial agenda, and we knew the more people had using it, the, the better chance that someone would pay us. So we even forced ourselves to write documentation. And none of us is native English or even close. So we had this goal to get all the technical stuff done in a file. I was going to say on paper, but of course. Uh, but get it done. And luckily, we had it was an American guy who's working at a university in Wisconsin. He said, he said to patch correctly my spelling mistake, which was if in the first fix or whatever. And then he sent another one, and another one, and another one. And after like the, the fourth patch, I think I did in the mathematic applying script in Perl. Uh, and then he sent like another 150. Uh, Expecting the manual, fixing all the spelling mistakes, checking everything. Which is really good. So I think it might bad English actually help. Uh, and what you prioritize. When you do the startup, you have to prioritize things. So we have we were pretty clear when we start talking to people that we were an absolute mess when it came to paperwork. And none of us were good at it, or even, we're not just bad, we were catastrophic. Uh, and we thought, like, you know, should we get the lawyer in or whatever and try to clean up the bit? <coughs> After thinking a little bit, very little, we think, <coughs> let it get more users in a bit more money, and then we can get someone else to fix it to actually professional later. And um, it actually worked. We got an investment, we got professional administrative people who were, you know, literally ripping part of the hair out, but they fixed it, so it worked. <coughs> if we try to spend time on that, we might not make enough uses, we might not have done it, <coughs> so uh, but recommended is it's easier and simpler to spend a few minutes thinking about the legal and administrative framework if you ever got a new startup. Doing it like we did is succeeding in spite of so, since the basic idea was to get spread, I mean, if we're going to work on the business side and get people embedded in the stuff they sell, uh, we needed to be available everywhere. So we spent some time uh, to implement connectors to our computer languages. And the first one in bold, we did. Uh, so we spent money or time or hired people to do them. Uh, the C connector and the sharp connector was five miles ago at least, but the C was the first one, Java second, ODBC then, and C sharp. But already in 1996, uh, Rasmus Leerdorf, the founder of PHP, contacted us and had a couple of patches for Minecraft to make PHP work with it. And we applied them and changed them. So that's why it's partly <coughs> we re we rewrote the code. And we can't say we like PHP, but Rasmus was a super guy. <laughs> uh, and his still is. I mean, I had a 50th birthday party this summer, and he came over from the US to attend it. Uh, he's still a friend. Uh, but, well, PHP was kind of ugly, but 
like Greece, uh, Rastos was really good at this community stuff. So there were other web solutions at that time. It was technically better, but they were very, you know, you're not good enough to be part of this. Uh, and the version like, you know, everyone help actually works way better over time. Because uh, if you want to set really high bars for someone to help, well, you lose the good people with the bad people. <coughs> and all the other languages on this slide, I used to, you know, ask here in high school audiences, so it's a bit cheap. You know, what programming languages do you use? Do you use anyone who doesn't have a connection to MySQL? Uh, I haven't really heard of anyone. People come up with languages that are like, oh, this doesn't have it. You ask another one, they say, no, 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 I've seen this connector. Uh, which is kind of cool. And the other thing we spent time on, and this is from very, very early on, was porting it to all operating systems. It's not that important now, but if you go back to the mid 90s, there was plenty of Unixes around. Linux was not dominating at all. And you have things like we even made it work on VMS, which is completely dead now. It was a pain. But the reason for this, when we were self employed computer consultants, we spent, we often sold software, and then after we sold it, we ported it. So if we didn't port fast, we didn't make any money. So we were just forced to learn different operating systems. We typically had like, you know, we didn't even have a computer at all. So we went to the customer and said, can we stay stay the night? <laughs> uh, and we did, and the next morning it should work. Uh, and we did that a couple of times. Uh, the hard way to learn. Uh, so we were, the base code for MySQL was very portable. We had things like MySys was still in there, but not completed on this. So all the system calls had a wrapper, which you could localized things. Uh, we used different portability stuff since I've installed all these different open source packages that try to detect which operating system was. We uh, used Autocom very early on. We actually had our own corporation system that was more advanced in some ways, but when I had the choice of trying to document that or use another, I just thought about documenting it for an hour and then I just, you know, because it was useful, you could at the same time compile five different versions uh, of your software with different debug options, etc. But all the things we did that with was not fun. Um, another thing is like 64-bit versions. In the mid-90s, or end of the 90s, it's a big deal that, you know, we had a three-year plan to do a 64-bit version of the software. And we went like, well, we got the uh, Alpha, whatever, and they could talk. And the next day, we had a 64 bit big version. We had like one bug. Uh, if you have clean code, 64 or whatever bits is just a recompile. So, making money, a part of the startup is important. Well, the MySQL license was uh, GPL, and if you included that in another program and link to it, you could pay us to get the same code on our license, the so called dual licensing. We did some of that, but most of our income was actually people who just paid for support and never used it. So early on, we had excellent economy because people just paid us without doing, we did nothing. <laughs> and we had almost no cost because it was just two people part time. Uh, and you know, we had a share of our on Windows, which because uh, Monte hated to reboot his single computer into Windows, it took him hours to do a Windows release. So he did, just didn't want to do that. And people paid for Windows, so then they could pay it for MySQL. But it was a full version, but basically, it didn't even say a pop up, it just said in the manual, if you use this commercially, please pay us. And people did. Probably just one in a 50 or whatever, but it didn't matter. If you have enough, big enough numbers, you get the uh, We're pretty. Soon had you know enough money and a lot of incoming emails, so we started getting you know can we get help to answer them? So we looked at our mailing list and sent an email to people like you know do you want to get some money it's months for helping us answering email? We didn't really do hiring in the normal sense. Uh, as I said, when we got administrative people, they rehired and got contracts with everyone. But we would just sent email like you know you've been really good at the mailing list for the last <coughs> year. Or two. You want to, you know, uh, be paid by us instead and do that full time? And a couple of people say yes, and they work very, very well. It's nice you don't have to do any, you know, you don't have to sex CVs, you don't have to do 
interviews, because you already know that people can do the job. But since this were getting quite big, and as I said, we were catastrophes with paperwork, and we had no business experience, we kind of figured that you know, we had a chance to build something bigger if we got a real company, etc. So in 2001, we got investment from a couple of Nordic investors. We got the CEO uh, who actually had business experience. But the hiring process was quite easy. We just knew one guy in the close friendship who had been at the database company and was currently CEO. So we called him up and asked. And he, of course, said no <coughs> first, and then looking a bit closer, he joined. Um, I think it turned out to be pretty damn good considering the, you know, how extensive our value was. Probably took a lot of time. And 2004, we moved the head office to California, which was a bit different. Because then it split the company in half the other way. And in 2005, I talked at this little side conference to your Oscar and some a little abstract project, uh, but a lot of energy uh, called Groupon, but I hardly hadn't heard of at that point. I heard it a bit more later, but uh, I talked to like a group of like, I think it was just 15, 20 people in the room, and most of all of them caught about it was a Groupon. Uh, so part of it was a talk, and then afterwards was going through the business girl schemas and stuff, and see what I could help with. But it was an impressive energy, because at that point, as I Talk to people before. When people ask me to recommend, you know, a web content management system, I went, you know, you look around, you find 50, 100 of them, and they're all almost equal. And it was just a pain to choose. There were no right choice. Uh, but Drupal managed to be a bit better, get a bit more people involved, get even better, get more people involved, and suddenly you get like logarithmic growth. And now when you look around, you don't find 100 anymore. Most of the others are dead and gone, which I'm happy for, because I mean, choosing between one or two things you can handle, the human mind can handle, try to choose between hunger. And everyone you ask gives you a different list. Uh, it's hopeless. Uh, 2006, we started doing subscriptions. 2007, we were around 400 employees, so I already kind of felt a bit lost. I'm a small company person. I like to talk to people, I don't really like to buy it. When you start to get me a few hundred, you have to buy repeatedly. Uh, in 2008, we got acquired for $1 billion. But at that time, we had I'd taken out the three or four other investment rounds. So we didn't own that much of a company, but it was fine anyway. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it was also fun to see an open source company. We did close source software from MySQL Enterprise. That we, we did a monitoring service was source, source. But otherwise, MySQL was pure open source free software. And that was my idea was starting to show what you could do business with that. But the idea was actually more to show other developers what you could live on it. I mean, pay a salary. It was the idea to make a billion dollar company. So it kind of got a bit more. But, but it's usually, if you think the idea is really good, because I thought uh, I launched a company called uh, Aladdin Goldscript. We're still around a tiny company, you have to use GoScript interpreter that goes in printers. And we use this dual licensing. If you use GoScript on your desktop, it was TPL. If you wanted to put it in a printer with other software, either you do all the software TPL or you pay them. And I thought that was an excellent idea. And they were a huge company. They were like several hundred thousand dollars in income and seven people. They were huge. <coughs> I thought if you do it with a database, it should work even better. It is. <laughs> and in 2009, I left uh, Sun MySQL. I never waited for Oracle to buy Sun. It was, I mean, 400 people were too big for me. 30,000, whatever Sun was, was just scary. It was so much internal routine. So. While other people bought fancy cars, I burned all my receipts. <laughs> uh, I just couldn't handle, like, you know, how you get paid for train tickets and airline tickets and hotels and stuff. Well, it's such a complicated thing, and you should get copies, and you should send them there, and you should have approval there. <laughs> uh, and if you ever wonder where the name me comes from, well, Monty, the other co-founder, has a daughter called me. So we 
Finch Finch name. Um, she's now 20 something, but that's a bit older picture. <laughs> and she also owned quite a few shares in my school, so she quite well off. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I'll talk a bit about Maria DB later. Guess what her younger sister is called? And here's some basic stuff that you all should know and love, but I thought since Google is getting so big now, so it might attract some non open source people. Uh, so for me, I mean, when I started in the mid 80s, this open source was extremely hard to get rid of. It was, you know, if you have a thousand IT people, one of them. Uh, but when you try to sell the value of it, people go like, yeah, it's it, the development model, you have so many contributors, give you code and whatever. And people, I don't think people get that this is a very, very few things in code. We got was mostly testing and good ideas and good bug reports. Uh, I've seen bug reports to you know, commercial companies when people say it doesn't work. We said, like, you know, if you spend the time on the bug report, you improve your chance of getting a fix, like, under the But since someone gave us that bug report, you could fix it in a couple of hours. Uh, uh, so I would say like repeatable bug reports are worth as much as code because you can fix repeatable bug reports. What you can fix and people say, oh it broke, how? Well, it just didn't work. Uh, what would you do then? <laughs> or say, oh I did that and something happened and you know. And public bug databases. All free software open source project has public databases. And you can actually see what's happening. You can see the quality. You can see what kind of bugs comes in. You can see how long bug stays around. You can judge it. If you go to a closed source thing, you get nothing. If you ask how many bugs they have open, they tell you nothing. You do nothing. And that scared, I mean, when we started and we got investors, they said, oh, but you can't have your bug database public. All the customers will run the other way. Uh, but if you went to like stand the customers who never bought something, but the first guys who bought from us was like technical. So they actually looked at the bugs and figured out, well, this is not bad. Well, that's a bad bug. Well, we fixed that. Okay. So they saw it as something positive. But for, you know, the CIO who's never looked at a piece of code and see if it's like 10,000 open bugs in a piece of open source software, it's like, oh! Uh, but it's actually positive because if you look at the same closed source software, it might have 100,000 bugs. <coughs> and feedback, you know, early in my school, we had a gang in Moscow who was really pushing MySQL, they were doing web tracking large scale and web statistics and they couldn't afford to buy really big computers. So they basically came with suggestions how we <coughs> could do different parts of MySQL and said, if you implement this. So we wrote a little bit of code, sent them a patch, they compiled it, installed it in production in some places, <laughs> uh, checked it out and it worked on a really heavy road in real world and then sent back, you know, fixes. Oh, maybe if you do like this. And then when you look at, when you see bigger companies, they have test engineers that are not even close to that, because they actually spend time making MySQL way better with very small changes. A typical thing when you hire people is people will say, you should add a tool to service or something, what we did years later. But the really valuable things is like, if you change this little thing here, it would actually go 10% faster. If you add this thing to this command, it becomes more useful. Usually the smaller the ideas are worth much more. The big ones are so easy to have. It's the small ideas that, you know, a thousand small ideas that get implemented gives real value. Lots of testing old code. Things typically get used for things you didn't think about. So if you have enterprise features, whatever, it costs, you know, an extra hundred thousand pounds for CPU, very few people use them. And if someone tries to use it in any other way than intended by the developers, it tends to break. Open source code tends to be used in every imaginable way, misused, I should say. <laughs> uh, and it gets tested for that, and it tends to be fixed, bug fixed, or at least you limit so if you don't find it. <coughs> uh, so the whole code base gets tested. Uh, freedom independence. Very, very few people use this, but I was actually using. Do we code called Motif in the like early 90s? And each new release of Motif, I had to spend like two weeks trying to go around new bugs for my application. <coughs> it was painful. 
And even if I'm sure the source code was absolute hell, I prefer looking at source code than just you know doing random changes and hoping it would work. So while you don't need it that often, it is extremely useful. And a lot of times, other people will fix things for you by watching the source code. So if it's available, it makes a big difference. Security is not by obscurity. I kind of hate the, 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 like, like different versions of Windows and sometimes. <coughs> someone does it, like someone finds a horrible security bug, someone gives a new release and says, oh, this is fixed now. You find another horrible security bug, and then it's a new release, it's fixed now. And you don't, you never know how safe it is. Since it's closed source, you could have super large holes, but it could be really what they say. There's been plenty of security holes in open source software, but since there's plenty of independent experts who check things like Linux and MySQL, Apache, etc., so there's seldom not really large holes. And it's a possibility to check, like, to check the bug system, check different discussion board to get a feel about how secure we are. That's impossible with closed source software. Lots of ecosystem code, like look at the Drupal ecosystem. Well, the core developers have written percent, whatever. There's so much stuff around, which each piece is not worth that much, or most of them. But if you take 10,000 of them, they work enormous. <coughs> uh, and for us, and I guess for guys like us, well, uh, you can hire people that you don't need to interview. Uh, you have a community where people are active, and people do patches, so you know, like, if someone can do that, they can do the work. Um, and this is more for yeah, CIOs and etc. Like low, low total cost of ownership is stuff that business people want to hear. And it appears. But I would also say like lots of flexibility. Almost all the big websites, which I met one who run it on Windows, but almost all of them use open source extensively. And it's, I don't think they kind of want, because at the beginning we were a website using closed source. Uh, I don't really think that one just because of the lower cost. I would think that one about flexibility. Because if you're going to do a Facebook or a Google or whatever, or a Twitter, speed of change is one of the most important things. And if you have to negotiate with the vendor to change the product in some way, you know, it might take a year, and another year to develop. If you just hire five guys to change it, a lot of times pretty shrewd. Get a new product out, see what happened, change it, do another one. That the speed of change with open source that can be really high. Same with Drupal. You have so many different things to try. You don't really have to wait for someone else most of the time. If you know. So what do I do now? I invest in advice in a couple of companies like SkySQL that does uh, MySQL and uh, MariaDB support and so there. Mostly people I knew some before, which make it easy. Because you have a hundred applying and you can sort them by how good they are and you take the top. It's quite easy. I worked a bit with Maria DB, who's <coughs> Maria, who's a bit younger, and it's actually the same age as my daughter. Um, it's a fork developed by Monty, the other <coughs> main MySQL developer. I've been a developer all my life, but in MySQL I ended up on the business side because I was the least. I was the least bad at this side. So, I did the automation, I did the websites early on, I did automation, I did the installations, I did lots of developing stuff, but I did write both basically nothing on the core code in the database. I, I did write some of the portability pieces, but Walt has been working hard to remove every piece. <laughs> uh, I also worked with Known database related stuff like Orange HRM, which is like an open source HR management that I thought was interesting because like, it's pretty clear that you can do companies run open source for technical people, you know, people <coughs> read mailing lists and etc. But could you do it for business software? It's like, you know, HR keeping track of employees. And so far it's going pretty well. I do for most things, there's an open source cross cloud development environment for mobile phones, so you can write code and see and run it on all the phones. The issues there was the same as 2005 for CMSs. It's like, I didn't know the time when I started with it, but it's like 100 competitors. Well, probably 95 are absolutely crappy implementations, so very, very limited. Uh, but they still confuse everyone. 
I think we're just too grasp good technology. But it's very hard to get a good, good community for it. We have a few users, or I mean hundreds at least, who are extremely happy, but it doesn't grow like I hope it will. So it's a tough word out there. Another thing I care a lot about that I still spend time on, but I don't know if, how much it is in the Drupal community, software patterns. They're bad! <laughs> uh, and I actually got threatened by a very, very large company, like one of the three largest software companies in the world, saying basically, yes, you should license all our patterns. You know, we're preparing to sue a few people. It's hinted you might be one of them. And we choose not to do anything and not to license, but it was a it was plenty of cold sweat, almost literally involved in that decision. Because we thought that it would be we were still helping so many people for free. We thought it would be too big PR issue for them uh, to sue us. But it was not an easy decision, probably one of the hardest. Uh, but the, the thing is that all the big corporations who have like ten to hundred thousand software patterns can close down anyone. Anyone who had done a website that broke in 10 or 100 patterns, and anyone who had done a patterns can close it down. I don't think that's fair. Uh, if you see, I mean, the FFI, FFII have done sites with a you know, normal page, web page, and then signs with the pattern numbers from each part of the page. Uh, currently, it works because the big companies don't really want to sue people. But if you're too successful, well, you might just found yourself in a little suit over a couple of years and then they buy it cheaply. In Europe, software patterns are, there are thousands or tens of thousands of software patterns, but no one wants to sue about them because they're not legally, people aren't sure they're legally valid. And there's been two big fights in the European Parliament to make them legally valid. And what we said now, we're not going to introduce software patterns, we're just clarify. Uh, but in both cases, a lot of developers who spent their free time uh, helped change it. Because I met politicians, you know, in Brussels, they used to, they used to people paid by companies coming there, people paid by all the, you know, interest groups. So then they met people in the corridors and asked, who are you? Well, the developers. Well, who do you work for? Well, well someone else. Why are you here? Well, we took holiday and went over here. They go, well, what? <laughs> you know, hadn't, hadn't, hadn't ever seen that. To see a few people that actually went on holiday, to, went to Brussels to speak to politicians about software patterns, make them believe it. Okay, maybe it's not what the big guys say, you know, just a little thing to make clear, to clarify the law, to make it better for inventors. Because uh, my still got, we bought a company and we got like three or four software patterns, what we license free and etc. I never did it, but. I still think software patterns can be the biggest crash ever. And like the video lab guys, the French guys who do the video, they have a hell of a software pattern. Mm -hmm. They get, uh, you know, you can't do this, you can't do this, you can't do this. So something to, if it ever comes up again, spend some time on it. It's worth five minutes, and it's more the number of people involved that cares how much time each one spends. So, I want to keep up one of the, what I heard the hot topics, SQL versus no SQL. And of course, I'm a bit on one side, <laughs> uh, but I mean, for, one question is why to use it, if it's speed of development or speed of execution? And like, do you need the speed? Or are you actually, what you're getting with consultants for half the day to optimize your SQL? Uh, in my school, when we have people who are pretty big and so on, they need to speed up. Our consultants said they totally speeded up everything we work on, at least twice, everything. Uh, sometimes 10 times. So fixing your SQL is usually easier than moving to NoSQL. Uh, besides, none of the NoSQL ecosystems is even close to SQL or Postgres ecosystem. Uh, all the stuff around it, tools, etc. Analytics. Uh, I talked to Monty, the other master founder this morning, and one of the companies he is helping uh, up in Sweden had a massive MariaDB installation and they tried to move to MongoDB and they actually got some stuff, some core stuff go pretty good, I mean, really fast. And the rest of the stuff they did, they only did occasionally, that's like over 100 times over. 
question of that. Uh, because it was such a... <coughs> the reporting and other stuff it did just didn't work. And it was way too much time to try to speed that up. Because the very part of, the part of SQL is an optimizer. And in NoSQL, you want the optimizer. You will code it, all your queries, like you want them to execute fast. And for simple stuff, that's good. So there's stuff like, how many people know about handle socket? Well, it's a low-level thing where you connect uh, and just read and write rows. So you get uh, the done benchmarks. They haven't been as fast. I think it was Cassandra they went to that. But uh, MySQL by handle socket went inside the ten percent in speed or that at the low level. And this same data you can then do standard SQL queries, because handle socket is kind of below SQL level, but the same data uh, There's also stuff happening in new SQL, and here everything happened to be MariaDB, because MariaDB is what I know. Uh, there's things like dynamic columns that you don't have to, normally in MySQL you always have to create a column beforehand. <coughs> Since a couple of years now, maybe we have dynamic columns where you can just store, like most know as well, new columns for each row. You lose, it gets trickier to report with SQL than two, but at least it fulfills some of the development speed issues for SQL versus no SQL. Maria Deep also has a Cassandra engine in the latest alpha, and they're adding a level DB engine that's another no SQL from Google. Who's <coughs> Some very, very, very large websites you've heard of have decided to use that as their core. Uh, and not only Google. Uh, so this is so you can query the data, move it to the SQL, do uh, join data from the two stores, and etc. And that is the lowest. So my take is like, I'm absolutely sure there's people who definitely need no SQL. But it would surprise me if there's anyone in this room. Because <laughs> uh, you need such massive scale before it really makes a difference. And to take an example, I mean, Facebook, who's developed Cassandra, has been developing it for years, mm -hmm. exactly for their use case. Uh, last time I met them, we were still having over 10 MySQL full time people and, you know, 5 plus MySQL developers. And they're paying MariaDB for features of MariaDB. And that's despite of them having a plan to move everything to Cassandra. But it just doesn't work, so they have to they still have a massive MySQL installation. <coughs> so <coughs> it's there are plenty of good reasons to change. Like one I didn't cover is the speed of development. I know that especially MongoDB has been aiming a lot of speed of development. And I don't really know how, uh, how much difference it is if you use things like dynamic columns and the different things on top of how did we connect the uh, what's the, the last slide anyway? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> uh, there's one afterwards that says questions with me. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so the issues with NoSQL versus SQL is, is such a hard thing to compare because there's so many on NoSQL. So I don't think I think about the problem in detail. If you don't understand the problem, you're not likely to succeed with either NoSQL or SQL. And the big thing is, with NoSQL, all the developers has to understand it. So the big guys have you know, levels of implementation, so you can't really crash the whole thing. SQL, you have like a safety level. You know, you know if you're doing search statements, you can only screw so much up. If you do delete statements, <coughs> oh, you can do that. Uh, some stuff in NoSQL is a very sharp now. And then I would say, we still say like MariaDB, we trying to add the best scaling features to get the same scaling, or like 80% of what the best NoSQL does. <laughs> it will take a while before they're ready. So if you really need massive scaling, and you have lots of simple operations with NoSQL, it's a really good fit. The question is like, which one? Please give a big thank you to David.